how wonderful person this is Anton. And let's talk about aliens. Do, 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 do. Or non-existence of aliens. Do, do, do. Okay, this is actually the next part for the ongoing series on the Fermi Paradox. The apparent non-existence of any extraterrestrial intelligence anywhere out there, at least as of 2023, and at least according to pretty much all modern research that involved some of the most powerful telescopes we have available and some of the most detailed analysis using a lot of different concepts and a lot of different assumptions. But despite what you might have heard from other YouTube channels or other media, we still actually haven't found anything anywhere and that actually includes simple bacterial life or simple life in general anywhere outside of planet Earth. And so in this video we're going to focus on the famous concept known as rare earth hypothesis. The idea that maybe Earth is just super rare. Maybe we're the only life out there. But in order to understand all of this, we do have to discuss a little bit of history. And here I guess we can start in 1984 with the iconic Carl Sagan and Jill Tarter founding the now famous SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence the program that for several decades have been optimistically searching for life using any means possible and trying to find it anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. Various comets, various asteroids, various planets, and of course other galaxies. But it hasn't discovered anything definitive. No alien spaceships, no life on Mars, no advanced civilizations with Dyson spheres, and not even the weird bacteria in some kind of an asteroid discovered on planet Earth. Nothing anywhere which sort of intensified the so-called Fermi Paradox even more. So not only where is everyone, but where is anything? Is there really nothing else out there? Now SETI scientists don't believe so, and actually a lot of astrobiologists believe some kind of primitive life must exist somewhere, but I'll actually encourage you to watch one of the previous videos in the description that actually even tackles that question with a little bit more skepticism. But anyway, so back in the year 2000, two other researchers, Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee, published this book that you see right here. Rare Earth – Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe And in essence this was basically a verbalization of the idea that was sort of going around for a pretty long time in scientific circles. The idea that Earth is maybe unique, and very specific properties on Earth allowed complex life to arise, to flourish, and to become extremely common everywhere but it's not something that's going to occur possibly anywhere else. Ironically, they decided to propose this idea because of that famous scene in Star Wars where the most highly cantina portrays various aliens as something that's extremely common and something that's across the entire galaxy. Here, recreated in Legos, mostly because Disney is pretty tough with their copyrights, so I don't want to get in trouble. Anyway, this is actually one of my favorite Lego sets. And so their book, or their proposition, focuses on specific features that Earth has that make it extremely unique and make it a perfect place for complex life. But before we discuss this, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about something that was proposed by the famous Australian scientist Brandon Carter, who's actually also very famous for this. The first ever picture of a black hole created by anyone, which he actually created along with Jean-Pierre Luminet. And they did this back in 1979 on some of the first ever computers and it actually took scientists decades to recreate this using modern technology. But anyway, Dr. Carter expanded on the idea of anthropic principle that was originally proposed by Robert Dick in 1957. And this idea doesn't actually have anything to do with alien life or technology or extraterrestrials, it's just a general observation of our universe, specifically when you focus on things like various constants. Things like gravitational constant, things like Hubble constant, even things like pi. Why exactly are the constants the way they are? as if they've been fine-tuned for the emergence of life and the emergence of everything that we kind of take for granted. One good example here is actually so-called fine structure constant. We've discussed this in one of the older videos on the channel in the description below, but you can also find a real good explanation from PBS that goes through a lot of different examples of this particular constant. It's basically almost 1 over 137, and it seems to actually be found in a lot of different things in the universe, but it's extremely precise, or it has to be extremely precise for the universe to work. Had this number been a little bit off, we would not even have a nuclear reaction, or the electrons would not act the way they act. Had it been just a little bit stronger, for example, the sun would not even become the sun and remain as a kind of a gas cloud, with hydrogen not even fusing into anything. And so the strange observation that the universe is kind of finely tuned is now referred to as anthropic principle. But the main question being, why though? Why are all of the physical laws in the universe perfectly assembled for basically organic life to exist on planet Earth? Now this is more of a philosophical question rather than scientific, and a lot of religious people usually like to bring in God into this, 
But the thing is, even God would not explain anything here because we're talking about numbers that can be anything. And as a matter of fact, they probably are anything, just not here. And so a much better explanation that a lot of scientists started to accept is the idea of multiverse. The idea that there might be these multiple universes with slightly different constants and slightly different physics in them, which might have different things happening inside of them as well. And so even though we find ourselves in our universe with our own laws and our own constants, there might be others where things work differently and thus maybe other types of life can exist as well. But once again, this is not particularly scientific, mostly because it's basically impossible to prove this, so this is kind of more philosophical or potentially even religious. As a matter of fact, it might be one of those questions we might never be able to answer, simply because there doesn't seem to be any way for us to collect evidence. And scientists generally don't like to go on faith alone. And because I'm getting old now, I'm one of those people as well. Unless you provide evidence, I don't actually believe it. But let's just assume for a second that maybe this is correct, and this is just one of many 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 different universes with different conditions. And so it just so happens that our universe allowed our kind of life to exist. But the same life might not exist pretty much anywhere else in other universes. Well, this anthropic principle can now actually be applied to much smaller scale, including that universe itself. It's quite possible that, just like with the universes, certain planets also acquire just the right conditions, just the right properties, to be perfect for complex organic life. But just like with those universes, the actual amount of properties or variations of properties is mind-bogglingly huge, possibly even more than the number of planets in the entire universe. And by that logic, Earth could be extremely rare. For example, liquid water should be possible anywhere. But in order to maintain water for billions of years, and maintain these levels for a long time, preventing droughts or turning the planet into an ocean world, the planet, for example, has to have very specific minerals on the inside, such as in case of planet Earth, minerals like ringwoodite that I've described in one of the videos from a few years ago that should be in the description, that can only be created in specific conditions, specific pressures and temperatures, but then starts to possess properties where it can actually absorb a lot of water inside and release it very slowly over time. In some sense, acting as a kind of a sponge that constantly waters our planet. And that's just water. When you consider things like oxygen, you can obviously have a little bit of oxygen or a lot of oxygen, but in order to replenish it over time, you need to have plants and photosynthesis. That requires very specific conditions coming from the sun itself, and of course protection in the upper atmosphere such as the ozone layer. As a matter of fact, it requires a lot of things. Even the light itself has to be in just the right frequencies, in just the right amounts. The vast majority of stars in our galaxy would not be able to provide the right conditions for any kind of photosynthesis to take place. Okay, actually that's not entirely true. Some stars, such as red dwarfs, might be good enough for very primitive bacterial life, but even that is still debatable because some of the experiments have been so far not very conclusive. Once again, more videos in the description. And so, rare earth hypothesis essentially proposes at least some factors which make our planet very unique. So let's actually go through some of these factors they mention in the idea. For example, the solar system has to have the right arrangement and just the right amount of planets, including gas giants, that would protect the inner planets from potential collisions. In this case, it needs to have a Jupiter. It also needs to have an orbit that's stable enough for billions of years. Obviously also being in the right part of the orbit to maintain hospitable conditions for life. The planet should also have a bit of a tilt in order to provide seasons which would not be too severe in order to not cause extinction events. And the planet itself has to be massive enough to maintain permanent atmosphere and allow liquid oceans. It also cannot be too close to the star in order to avoid being tidally locked, but also not far enough in order for water to exist. And the star cannot be too extreme either. It should provide just the right kinds of UV light in order to encourage ozone layer, but not extreme light that would destroy everything on the surface. There should also be a way for the oxygen to cycle and exist in just the right amounts. And the planet itself has to have a core that's able to generate magnetic field for the planetary protection. And in order to stabilize its axes, it also needs to have some kind of a large moon, which is, by the way, extremely rare. For example, if it wasn't for a large moon that we have, our planet would be similar to Mars that basically wobbles and spins around every few million years. That's not something you want for a planet with permanent life. And we need a way to circulate everything from the surface through some kind of a plate tectonic activity. This allows us to circulate carbon and also allows us to circulate everything in and out of atmosphere, in the process stabilizing the planet for billions of years. 
But even on the grander scale of things, it also matters where you are in the galaxy. We have to be located in just the right part of the galaxy where the elements are enriched in metals just enough to support life, but not too enriched where things become too dangerous. And more importantly, we want to be far away from extreme stars that might go supernova really quick, and maybe even in some kind of a region that's a little bit more mild, but not too far where things don't actually reach anything. So even here, things have to be basically perfect. For example, by being on the outskirts of the galaxy, these planets might never actually receive enough heavy elements to even have terrestrial planets. But by being inside the center of the galaxy, we're risking constant bombardment from various supernova. So just need the right balance. And obviously, as the solar system traveled around the galaxy, it might have experienced some of these events already, specifically various supernova or various cosmic events that could have caused the extinction before. For example, Earth experienced the Snowball Earth at least twice, 2 billion years and 630 million years ago. And both of these extreme glaciation periods are still not entirely understood. But several explanations propose that it was maybe because of some kind of a cosmic event. The solar system might have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so many of these factors that we find in the solar system and on planet Earth seem to be kind of extremely well attuned for the existence of complex life. Even our Sun. Which is somewhat ironic, because Carl Sagan and a lot of earlier astronomers have always said that the Sun was very unremarkable and was just one of many stars in the galaxy. But in the last few decades we've discovered almost the opposite. Our Sun is kind of strange. First of all, it's a G-type star, which are quite rare. And second of all, it's just mild. It's kind of boring. It doesn't do much, which is why Earth had a lot of stability for billions of years. There are some other videos in the description that actually talk about several other solar or sun-like stars we've discovered that seem to have very similar properties, but they're extremely rare. There's like one or two we've found so far. And so when you take all of these factors into consideration and add everything up, it actually does make Earth unusually rare compared to everything we've discovered so far. All of the conditions we have on the planet seem to be kind of perfectly aligned. Almost like that anthropic principle when it comes to the universe. But once again, God is not a good explanation here either. Survivorship bias is. Because we exist here and because we are alive, by extension we kind of assume that this is something that's very common everywhere. But if you know anything about survivorship bias, that's not really how things work. There is actually quite a big chance that everything on Earth and the life on Earth is just extreme luck. Super luck. At least when it comes to complex life, because that's what authors of this book mostly focused on. They still believe bacterial life is possible, but even here, personally, I'm not even sure about that. There is a previous video on the rare earth hypothesis idea that I've discussed a few months ago that kind of explores why I think so in detail. But that's beside the point. Let's leave opinions for later. And so maybe microbes or very simple life could be possible, but for anything more complex, the requirements are just way too high. Which in essence answers the Fermi paradox. We might be alone. But there are obviously some criticisms for this idea as well. For example, when it comes to plate tectonics that the authors of the book propose as something extremely rare, in the last few years the scientists discovered that this might not be the case. A different type of plate tectonics has already been discovered on Pluto, and even moons of Jupiter, like Europa, potentially contain them as well. Now these are ice-based plate tectonics, but it still shows that some things that they assume to be rare are actually a little bit more common. At the same time, it's also maybe questionable what sort of function gas giants actually serve in various star systems, including the solar system. Does Jupiter actually protect us, or is it potentially responsible for more colliders that would have never reached planet Earth? It's not something that we can answer just yet, but this idea has been questioned by various scientists. A lot of scientists also don't think that our definition of the habitable zone, that we usually define as the zone where liquid water and thus life can exist, may not be very good either. It's actually a little bit primitive and does not expand on everything. And more importantly, it does not allow for exotic life, life that's maybe not organic but could still evolve to be very complex. And when it comes to intelligent life, well, we don't even have a good definition of intelligence. As became very apparent, I guess this year and last year, as everyone started to discuss the idea of artificial intelligence because of things like ChatGPT. We're pretty certain none of this is intelligent, yet we know we are. So the actual definition is still very murky. But I think the biggest criticism for the rare earth hypothesis is that, well, it's not really a hypothesis as much as it is just a description of things that led to life on planet Earth. In other words, it doesn't really make any predictions that can be proven, it doesn't propose any theories that can be tested, and the authors do not propose specific factors that created life. 
And so even though it's a pretty intriguing idea, it's more of a descriptive proposition rather than a scientific idea. But there might be a way to make it scientific by studying things like extremophiles. Bacteria here on planet Earth able to survive in extreme conditions that can then allow us to set various boundaries for the existence of life. But that's of course really far in the future and nobody is doing that as far as I know. But this is exactly what the scientists working for SETI are kind of trying to figure out and trying to answer. They're trying to answer these questions that could be maybe seen as a little bit philosophical, somewhat psychological, and maybe even theological. Not necessarily scientific. But questions that, if answered, could lead to maybe some peace of mind. Are we alone? If so, why? Are we not alone? Then where is everybody? And since this is actually one of the primary missions for the James Webb Space Telescope, we have approximately 20 years to collect enough data to start making sense of some of these questions. Because Webb is able to see a lot of different emissions coming from various planets, and it's also really good at detecting atmospheric composition, it might help us answer questions about certain planets that we always believe to be Earth-like, and whether anyone is, for example, breathing anything there right now, releasing things like, for example, carbon dioxide. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll never find anything, and maybe we'll kind of remain alone. And in billions of years from now, these conditions that were perfect for life will no longer be available, pretty much ending the era of life. And as sad or as depressing as it might sound, it also is a kind of a self-reflection piece where we need to realize that what we have right now is also super important. Everything around you, everyone around you, is kind of precious. At least according to what we are not seeing out there. And that's the main lesson here. Maybe if we are alone, we need to kind of be grateful for what we have and appreciate things around us a little bit more. So I don't know, go kiss a tree or something. Jokes aside though, it's a question I'm going to be tackling more and more in future videos, and we've discussed some of these concepts in some of the previous videos in the description. So stay tuned, subscribe, more videos coming really soon. Thank you for watching, I'll see you later. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye. Yeah, there might not be a lot of life out there, but there's certainly a lot of life on my desk right now. I gotta go clean this stuff.